Oh, we didn't select who's starting. Well, anyway, welcome to. Are we already. Oh, yeah, we're starting. We're streaming and recording? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, welcome to this research software hour number, whatever it is. Is it 24 now or something? I think so. So. Today 23. we. 23. 23. Okay. So today we are, we don't have a single topic prepared, but we're going to go through all of the advanced questions from the Cobra Refinery workshop that just ended this morning. And we will, these are all questions which could have a short answer and a long answer as, well, either Anne or Radwan said, I don't remember who, but anyway, so we will go a little bit more in depth than was answered during the workshop. Should we say something about the actual workshop, like what that is? Oh yeah, what's Code yes. Refinery? Yeah. Maybe a link or something. Yeah, so in the HackMD there is the, on, relatively on top, there is the link to the questions, which is also the, to all the questions from the six workshop days, which is also on the workshop page. So this was a workshop last week and this week six half days and we lots of people involved uh, I don't know 200 participants and we we discussed git github or collaboration uh, documentation reproducible research social coding licensing testing Jupyter notebooks modular code development did I miss something and it ended today a couple of hours earlier we are I'm, uh, I don't know, I'm really uh, exhausted, but it was a lot of fun. But we thought it would be a um, good idea to take some of the questions. Okay, so first of all, uh, one thing that was really good is that we documented, we saved all the questions and answers to, to that workshop page. Mm -hmm. And here for the show today, we took a couple of them where we thought it would be maybe interesting to talk about them. And they are listed on the HackMD in no particular order. But what we can maybe do is that you can vote on the questions that we should talk first with a colon plus one colon. So then you get a, we get a thumbs up in the HackMD. Maybe we should show the HackMD. Can I like screen share and show that? Yes. Here, yeah, this is how it looks. Um, and here somebody might be us, might have been us voted on that question. So many questions in no particular order, and you can you can add additional questions or add comments or vote like like here. Oops. Oh, oh no, I did something. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. I will stop sharing again. Mm. Or should I keep sharing? I don't know. Well, someone should share, or I can share here. Actually, I got it set up to share directly from a web browser, so maybe that works. Um, yeah, so here we go. Um, where should we begin? Should we start at the top? Yes. <laughs> Let's okay. maybe wait a few, I don't know, maybe some question will... Uh... No, mm -hmm. well, we, we should start with the first one. Yeah. So, um... so the first question yeah. would be then, and I think it came up, well, it was a comment. Uh, the biggest challenge in onboarding new collaborators uh, with no prior version control experience. No. So maybe to turn it into a question, so how how should how do we onboard colleagues, collaborators, students mm -hmm. with uh, no par prior version control experience? No. When I was studying about how to be a good supervisor, one of the things that struck me is that when you start in, or one of the examples they gave is company career ladders, and for that it was sort of clear that when you're starting as a junior developer or something, the first months are just learning how to use the tools and integrate to the environment. And 
that's it. And well, you know, when you come to an academic group, it just, there's not that kind of thing. I mean, ideally there would be, but it's like, okay, well, you're smart, you can figure it out and people are just left alone. So I think more than anything, it's a matter of just agreeing that it's not okay to work alone. And for that, the supervisor, the rest of the group has to be on board. And if so should we, should we convince supervisor? Is it what you are saying right <laughs> <Yeah>. now? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, like if the supervisor doesn't care and just wants you to do whatever, it will almost always be faster in the short term to work alone instead of with people. So like how? Yeah, but I, I think from what, from what I have seen from experience, this is true what you see. If the supervisor is saying, yeah, you should uh, really collaborate and uh, use uh, whatever. If this is Git, use Git, then it, it will work very quickly. Mm -hmm. So support from above. Support from above, yeah. as usual. And time, because of course one can send people to training. Uh, we could mention um, pair programming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for virtual mm -hmm. control, the first thing maybe is that they need to understand that this is useful. Because for mm -hmm. instance, we have seen even uh, software carpentries, they do very novice uh, mm -hmm. level uh, workshops. Still, if they don't understand this is useful, um, I don't think they are very motivated to learn. Mm -hmm. So maybe like we said, they are relevant pair programming or maybe uh, using the GitHub interface, showing the GitHub interface maybe good start, I don't know. You have done this kind of training rather than with GitHub. Yeah, I've done tra training Git without command line. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be command line. And we have actually another question later about that. So it doesn't have to be command line. It can be web interface, it can be graphical interface. Uh, maybe uh, introducing code review early so that mm -hmm. every change is discussed and then we can talk about commit messages and commit to granularity and whether this is the right branch. Mm. What else? Yeah. Yeah, How can we convince? The guide, uh, some guide, provider. simple oh, yeah. guide. Yeah, like a cheat sheet. Yeah, cheat sheet on how to collaborate. What about providing actual mentoring? I mean, mentoring. how often yes. I know people, it's like, yeah, I have a supervisor and my instructor who's supposed to be the one mentoring me but we talk once a week and they tell me okay do this and do that and now then i'm on my own like that's not mentoring that's basically telling you what to do and letting you suffer alone yeah although i think talking once a week is still pretty good i mean it can be <laughs> it more i people. would like yes <laughs> yeah once a year already <laughs> Yeah, mentoring, maybe yeah. Uh, code review sessions. So on um, working together on screen share or on a, on a big uh, yeah. projector. Mm -hmm. I think it depends here if this is a person uh, is asking on uh, is is alone and want to have new collaborator or oh, this is the other way around. Mm -hmm. They would like people to uh, to collaborate mm -hmm. and they don't know how to onboard them. which is a, a bit different in a way. Yeah. So if this is, uh, uh, you, you, they don't want to collaborate uh, with version control, I would say don't make it as an option. Mm -hmm. So every time they ask you something, you go to the uh, version control and you refuse to do anything without. Mm -hmm. So then at some point they will get the habit that anyway, if they want your help and they want you to collaborate, they will have to go through version control. And what if they are convinced about version control, but... Um, but need support. Or, yeah, but need support and send you a bit big pull request with 50 commits and 40... Yeah, okay, okay that's... Uh, we have yeah. another question like that, no? Yeah, okay. should we... We have a uh, way to. Yeah, maybe we should move on. It was yeah. an, an, a good one where. I, uh, yeah. Where you can find it. 
Let's see. How do you oh. reject changes? I have received a pull request that I don't want to merge. I have reviewed and asked for changes. What happens now? What if I wanted to just reject yeah. the request? Where is it? Uh, it's. Uh, can we move it up? Yeah, I Hold can on. move it up. Uh, okay. Yeah, so the voting still counts, but um, this is a good topical. Okay. Just to follow up your question. Yes. Up. Where is your? That is your question. You removed it? Yeah. OK, yes. Yeah, so the question is, how do you actually reject changes? Uh, what if you get a pull request? And it was the intentions are good, but you don't want to merge it or you cannot merge it because it's mm -hmm. it's either like wrong, wrong branch, or it's something that you didn't want or something that doesn't fit. How do you deal with that? I have many times pretended I accept the request. <laughs> <laughs> Just revert it back. <laughs> yeah, so one option is I do, I do like a sherry pick uh, and pretend I do some changes and I put the name of the guy in the, in the mm. commit. So he, mm -hmm. the name appears. Usually it, it makes yeah. his or her day. And that's fine. I say, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. But it's going to be a good solution if the. Like, let's say the pull request is not perfect, but it's really... Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, okay. even if this is really bad, if I have no collaborators and you are really mm -hmm. dying to get people to collaborate, I, I, I have done it many times. Yeah. Because it can but be motivating. I, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. And then I, I was saying, yeah, maybe next time we talk just before, because um, maybe we can do something a bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone can also follow up by saying that i mean not immediately like closing and rejecting it but also by offering that like mentoring again yeah let's talk about it let's let's work it together let's split it up into more pull request let's rework it but of course it's extra work yeah, yeah. i mean the, actually this is more how i do it now because i don't have the like the patience to share a pick or to do something mm -hmm. so i tend to say yeah no it's too big yeah how can we ab avoid the situation so how what can we do so that this doesn't happen? I think we cannot control the size of pull requests, but you can give recommendation uh, yeah. when you have an issue, having a template saying uh, one one thing at a time or things like that. Yeah, contribution guide. Um, yeah. yeah, directing exactly. people to towards first. Let's talk about it on a like issue or discussion. Mm -hmm. Let's first talk about it. Tell me your idea. Tell me what you're up to. Let's, uh, yeah, let's think a little bit, and then you can start to work, mm -hmm. or a draft pull requests, or work in progress merge requests. Yes. This show me, good, yeah. show me the hard finished thing, so that we can comment before spending a lot of time on something yeah. that doesn't fit. Maybe we should I mean, discuss yeah. this in the social coding lesson. Some like, if it's a small mm -hmm. typo fix or something then I would just make the pull request. And if it's not accepted, then whatever. If it's something big, then you want to discuss like how to contribute to do that. And this is not really different for every project. Like a project doesn't have to be, have to make its own guidelines to say, don't send us a massive pull request changing everything at once without talking about it. Yes. I mean, it depends what we call massive. Mm -hmm. If this yeah. is really big changes or yeah. if this is like cosmetic changes. I remember. In and it depends on the experience. No, I would say like the first time I would be very, I would try to be very nice. Mm -hmm. But if mm -hmm. the second time I say again the same, yeah. uh, maybe I will be a bit more direct and I will say, okay, maybe we try to split. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure there is one good answer, actually. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's a problem that you sort of work on as your project gets larger. So when it's small, I'll have a line in the bottom of the readme saying, this is a beta project. I do or don't welcome pull requests. If it's just for me, I might say, yeah, like, this is just a script for me. Please don't send pull requests. It's better for you to make your own copy. And then 
in the middle life, I'll say I'm still actively working on those. Um, I welcome changes, and then later on, I'd say, okay, yeah. this is now orphaned. Don't expect me to do much. So contributing guidelines. Yeah. Should we go to the next question? Yes. About plain text files or word files. Yes. So, um, yeah, um, so actually this is something that I've done before. So, well, first I can give the story of LaTeX files. So I'm collaborating with my supervisor who clearly doesn't know anything about version control. And they'll say, oh, please send me a copy of the manuscript. So I go, like I take my repository, I make a new branch called supervisor's copy. I'll export mm -hmm. that, send it to them, and then go check out my branch again, work on it. And then later when the supervisor said, here's my changes, I'll commit my stuff, go to the supervisor's branch, import it again, commit it, and then go back to my branch and merge them using Git. So the supervisor's being trapped with Git, even though they don't know it. Yeah. So what I've about Word too. files? So I've done the same with Word files. So I just have the repository. There's nothing that requires Git to be plain text files, but then your merging and diffing won't work mm -hmm. out of the box. But you know, it's better to have it tracked in Git than not. So, you know, I just do it. And then as people are sending in, sending around their versions by email, I'll put it in Git and then try to keep it merged. And at least I have a record in a good format. Mm -hmm. And then at some point I even made, well, not made, I found some Git word diff and merge drivers. Really? And I missed that. In which format did you store it on your side? The, this, uh, the Word document? Just in the Word document format. Nothing fancy there. Hmm. Like, I mean, there was no point in changing. It worked well enough, so. And Git figured it out? Like, you could actually diff and merge and... Uh, no, it didn't work, but I think maybe I found a... Uh, Microsoft Word diff tool and then configured that. Um, Is it something you would uh, recommend to do? Or? Well, I'd recommend if you want to do <laughs> advanced collaboration, don't go emailing files and Word around. But <laughs> I mean, it was better than the alternative, which is one person Let's say it didn't actually make it good, but it made it, it gave me a sl slightly better tool in order to make some order out of chaos. So you would not recommend like Google Doc? Well, Google Doc would have been better, yeah. But, well. But it was already too, uh, yeah, too mean, advanced or too... <laughs> I mean, some people, they like, just refuse to, uh, to use Google Doc. Yeah, like... Yep. This is the this is the kind of thing where I'm not going and making new suggestions because I don't expect much to come out of that. Yes. Okay. So I understand. <laughs> I have the same. I had the same kind of. Yeah. People. But yeah, like these days, anything that I do, one requirement is it has to be in a single place that everyone can easily edit and track it. Yeah. And like, don't make me a part of something if you're mailing around Word documents and expect me to send changes back and I mean, forth. what you are talking here is really like to find. I have also this problem where I cannot find if I have a, a doc file, I don't remember where I put it. <laughs> so if, if I go to my Git, yeah. GitHub, I, I know where to find stuff. Can't even search. Mm -hmm. So this findability of all the different uh, all my different data is, is maybe a good thing to, to put in GitHub. Yeah. So next time we show in Code Refinery how to diff Word with <laughs> Git. <laughs> Thanks to Richard. Okay. And if I wanted to store it in a different format, what would be like a good compatible format so that I can still export it? Mm. 
I was thinking about converting with, I don't know, Pandoc between yeah. something and Word mm -hmm. and then uh, tracking the something. I have tried that. I have wasted a lot of time uh, on this. It does never really very, very good, but I have done it many times, yes. Maybe it's better to, as the word, or no, what's it? So store it in the word format because converting from something else back to word is probably going to lose some formatting. But then you can, in your diff driver, you can have pandoc convert both copies to plain text and then diff it. But how do you, how do you merge then with Git? Because it's, it's nice if Git yeah. can merge for you, but how can it then? Well, I'm, I'm happy enough if it shows me the diffs and then I merge manually. OK. Mm. I mean, maybe that's what I did back then. Mm. I don't, I probably. I don't remember. Yeah. I don't have a better solution either. Before we move on, maybe we, s if somebody joined later, we just explain a bit what we do here. So we have collected a couple of questions that came up in the Code Refinery workshop last week and this week. It's on HackMD. We have a list. You can vote on them, and we will try to answer as many as possible, to answer and discuss as many as possible. And the next one, which got two votes, I just moved up is uh, so the question was since i'm a beginner i have issues with merge and rebase so git merge git rebase i would like to know which is better in what circumstances and maybe we should first say what how do they differ and then when do we prefer them in when do we prefer the one and when do we when do we prefer the other So how do they differ? They differ, so they combine, they combine developments from two different branches. With a merge, we get a, typically we get a new commit and the history is not changed. With the rebase, we, we move one branch behind the other. So we, in, with the rebase, we modify history, but we get a linear history, but it's modified. So it's two, two ways of incorporating changes from one branch to the other. So which one is better? Well, it depends, but in on what situation does it depend? How do you, when do you what do you normally do? I mean, I can start, I can say that uh, I use rebase quite a bit when I'm with my local branches. So if I have a local branch, something happens on the default branch, and I want to then update the local side branch, I may use rebase to move it back, to move it to the end. I don't really use rebase much outside. So if I send merge requests, pull request, I normally don't use it, unless the project wants it. Wants it. That's fine. Any comments there? I mean, when is a rebase better? Rebase is better if you if you I think would it's like better to better for collaborators. No, sometimes it's easier for them if you do it locally because you do it with your local uh, yeah. work. I think it's easier for collaborators to understand the history. Yeah, the way it will look, it will look like one change happened after another. With merge, it looks like they happened maybe at the same time on different places. Mm -hmm. I think it will be harder to read uh, the changes uh, with a merge. Yeah, mm -hmm. if we do a git, a git bisect later, git bisect can work with merge with merges, but I think git bisect might be slightly easier with yes. a linear history. So git bisect is easier. Conflicts, if we have conflict in one, we have also conflict in the other. There is no free ticket. But I think conflicts, I, I find them a little bit easier with merges because you resolve them only once. With rebase, yeah. you resolve them one after another, after another, after another. Yeah. So it maybe gives a, it gives an indication on when to use yeah. merge or rebase. If you have a, a development or 
make conflict because they are like parallel development but on the same maybe topics of files then you would merge mm -hmm. if this is quite a parallel independent changes then you would rebase Yeah, if the code is already published, then I would not oh, yes. rebase. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, that's a good uh, tip. Do not rebase if you have, a, except if you made a mistake. Yeah, if it's like some catastrophic mistake, then yeah. maybe. Mm -hmm. um, anything else to say? Should we move on? Well, you can move on. Yeah. With yes. So we have many plus one. <laughs> yeah. So what is which one is here still a little bit on the topic? before we change topic completely. How about I take this one with the graphical user interfaces, because mm -hmm. that's still somehow we are still in the Git. So the question is, do you always work from terminal? And are there, does it mean that Git graphical user interfaces are not useful? I use a lot of graphical uh, yeah. interface with Git, <laughs> especially when I work with the Jupyter Lab, for instance. Mm -hmm. So which one do you use? So it's Jupyter Lab and then it's the extension. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. the Git extension. So the Git extension, GitHub extension. Yeah, with R Studio, I I always use uh, the Git uh, from the interface mm -hmm. because I oh, only yeah. have to click. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Richard? I mostly use command line, but I. I think there are places where it would be more efficient to use the graphical interface. Like, especially for things like commenting on pull requests, I'll use the GitHub interface to make suggestions and merge them that way. Um, but I think maybe I'm just too old fashioned and there's more modern ways. I mean, my editor is Emacs from a terminal, so there's mm -hmm. not much room to use something else. Yeah, so answering the question, I mean, graphical user, user interfaces are definitely not useless, so they are useful. Yeah. I use the web interface quite a bit, both in GitHub and GitLab, especially for small changes. If I want to fix a typo somewhere, I don't really clone, create a branch, fix the typo, commit, merge request. I mean, then if it's just my own project, I go I go and edit it directly on on the on the web interface. Also, if I want to remove branches which have been forgotten and merged, I remove them from the web interface because it's just click, 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 and they are gone. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have used the GitHub desktop for teaching, so I don't use it myself in my work, but it was also really convenient. There are other graphic user interfaces, yeah. source, source tree. Uh, so I think they are good. There is nothing, yeah. nothing wrong about them. Also, what can be nice is Git integration in a text editor. With so Atom, then, for instance, it's really yeah. good. Or VS Code, it's really good. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Well, yeah, perfectly fine. Yeah. Okay, we are halfway in time. And now let's take them in order here. So if you are watching live um, in the HackMD, you can vote on questions. Please be interesting also to hear. Vote. On questions which are further down also we have yes. a lot more down there which we're checking up yeah so what's next so maybe this the next one in there in there which is a um, great question what if what if somebody what if your our code gets used but doesn't get cited what to do What happens if your paper doesn't get cited? What do you do? Or you make a contribution. You cite your own paper <laughs> in the next one. <laughs> no. <laughs> Shall we do that for <laughs> software? Yeah, so I think you... Radovan had a very good suggestion before we started the, the stream on how to count contribution. <laughs> Yeah, so one, one, one thing one can do, that which we discussed pre-stream, pre was I'll make the package library code 
put it on some standard place like Python package index or Conda or NPM or FPM or, or crates. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of these standard places where software gets distributed mm -hmm. because at least you can then count, you get some metrics on how often is it downloaded, which may or may not be useful because it could also be downloaded by automated testing scripts. But you can also see often what other project use it. So if it's if it's in our requirements.txt or an environmental YAML of another project, then you can get metrics of at least you can get an overview of who is using the code. And maybe you can use it to, to the document uh, impact. Yeah. And maybe simpler. I, th I think step number one is to make it citable mm -hmm. and make it really visible that it's how to cite it. I think people generally want to cite if they know how to. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's right. If you go uh, in the repository and you have in first big how to cite, you yeah. will probably copy past. Mm -hmm. If you have to yeah. search and you can't find it in less than half a second, or mm -hmm. you will probably say, OK, no need to cite. And I mean, if it's something like you leave some random code on your web page, a journal will say, this is not citable. And then, well, too bad. So that's why I copied this other question from below. What's the main purpose of the DOI link? Why not cite the address of the GitHub repository? I mean, I guess that's a very good question. Yeah, number one, met metrics again. And then number two is, um, well, I can remove the GitHub repository. Or I can, yeah, delete my account, Based and then nobody it. will find it. Mm -hmm. So for fair purposes, for findability, accessibility purposes, it's better to have a digital object identifier because then the whole code gets copied over somewhere else and preserved for mm -hmm. a couple of decades. Yeah, and it's clear. Cite this DOI. No yeah, I mean, it's invisible, yes. Yeah. So we should always recommend to create a DOI. Mm -hmm. I, actually, some journal now I have seen the reviews, they, they reject uh, GitHub repositories saying mm -hmm. this is not a DOI. Mm -hmm. I, this was the first time I, yeah. I, I saw that. Which, I mean, I guess makes sense when there's a better alternative. And we have learned in Code Refinery how to get a DOI from your GitHub repository when you have a release. So mm -hmm. it's something easy to get. Yeah. Should we move on? We have like 25 minutes left. Yeah. yeah. So there is a related, well, there is also a Git question, but maybe we should also move on to other topics. Should we just go in the order here? I don't see any question getting really more votes than one. Okay. So there is something about testing. There is something about notebooks. There is more testing. There is one about Git. There are two more questions oh. about Git. Hmm. We can also quickly do the Git and then we move on. I don't know. Okay, maybe let's take them in order because we will mm -hmm. take more time to decide. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Okay. I'm a bit tired. So. Yes. Okay. Next question. Should I read? Yeah. Yeah, I can't see the question anymore. Oh, okay. Oh, it's up there. So it's moved yeah, yeah. up. So okay. the question is, how do we test functions? So this is not about testing. How do we test functions whose output is unknown to us? Mm -hmm. um, for instance, we know that they are supposed. We know what they are supposed to do, but we don't know whether the result is correct or not. How should we test them automatically? Yeah. This is, this is great. No, uh, this is what we want normally. Yeah. Well, I could ask. Whenever you make a function and you don't know what the output is supposed to be, how do you know if it's correct or not? So, but here we know, so it's good. Uh, so if if we know, we we take values for which we know the results and we test it. 
No, but here I think the question is that it's unknown. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, so we, we don't, don't know, know what it produces. produces. But we, don't we, know, know we know what they are supposed to do. If you know what they are supposed mm -hmm. to do... I interpret oh, yeah. this as like running a simulation and you don't know what the output is and your science is what does this code return as the output. Yeah. Like, it's a bit a big function to test for unit testing. But <laughs> so, yeah. I then would I would take uh, one of, as a reference. Yeah. If you like, really don't know. Like in that case, if the function itself is the science, then you would break it down and try to test some of the other yeah. components. Like all the things, like what are the parts of the function that you do know what the output is? And can you test those? Even a test which runs the function and makes sure it still actually works and doesn't raise an error is better than nothing. But yeah, like I guess this sometimes happens for me. There's like, there's this big code and then I don't know its output, but I don't bother testing that, but I test all the little pieces. And then for the big thing, just make sure it runs without an error. So I don't make a syntax error. And I realize that, well, I'm the scientist here. I have to keep the science correct. So um, you split in, in, in sub function or in other function? Yeah. Yeah. Like for code refinery, I was making this script ffmpeg edit list that would do the videos. There's test for several small functions inside of it, but not for the whole thing because, well, the whole thing was too big. I don't know how it works. I'm not bothering with that yet, but the small things, the utility functions, yeah, I mean, here, here we should uh, maybe separate what, uh, and I think in code refinery it was also a bit confusing. We mostly mm -hmm. introduced unit testing, mm -hmm. not like testing uh, mm -hmm. like the science and the big code. That's true. That's a good. Because it's more more like benchmark. Uh, when... I don't know. I call it more benchmark than yeah. testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And often this end to end test is often the starting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at least maybe we don't know what whether this is correct, what's outputted, but at least we have a reference code and we compare, we, we make sure that it's the same as before. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm not even sure whether this is super correct, but at least I create a test so that I I noticed when, when it's changing. Mm -hmm. So I just decide. So if you fix the bug, correct. you yeah. make sure yeah. you don't accept the fix. I have <laughs> seen that actually. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But sometimes they don't want to accept the fix because uh, they know this is a bug, but it's, it changed the results. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question, maybe a different question for some other time, like, uh, what if you make a good change, but it breaks the test? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or it, it breaks the science because yeah. it breaks uh, whatever you have published. So we try to, to split. This is to do summarize. No, uh, try to split, and otherwise you get uh, one result as a reference. Yeah. And maybe also, that's, what? Hmm, what? Like maybe that's the difference between a software engineer and a research software engineer. Software engineer, you know, you're making something and you know what it should be. The research software engineer, you're making something, but the research is as important as the software and you don't know what the outcome is or where you're going exactly. Yeah, but still it can be also something I recommended in doing the workshop was to try to express in words, like when you look at the code, how do you even, how do you notice whether this looks reasonable or unreasonable? Mm -hmm. Try to express it in writing, write it down. What, what am I looking at? Like the, the graph should look like this, then it's correct. Mm -hmm. And then express it in writing, and then if it can be written down, it can be scripted, and then it can be automated. Oh, yeah, you can check like a range of values or things like that. Yeah. Or yes. does it have the right shape? Does it have yeah. the the right statistics? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point actually. Yeah. Okay, twenty minutes left. Let me scroll up and down here. Let's take the next 
question, which is now about notebooks. Oh, or maybe are, let's stay with the testing. I will take another one. Yes. Just that we don't change topic too much. Mm -hmm. It's still about test. Uh -huh. And the question is, some people like to collect functions in a script at the beginning of the script or at the end of the script. Others, oh no, it's not about testing. It's about more about organization. Anyway, mm -hmm. so some people like to collect functions at the beginning of a script or at the end of a script. For, ex for instance, in our projects, uh, what do you recommend should we collect functions at the beginning, at the end, in external files mm. and include them that come with a test. How do you how do you do it? I think with researcher I tend to have uh, the function, the test, because otherwise uh, they may believe you can have a function and no test. So it's like to really put the uh, emphasis on the fact if you write a function, you write a test. For big projects, I have seen they usually organize a function, a test in completely separate, uh, separated even folders and uh, files, and they, it's, they have many files for tests. I do it similarly. And how about independently of tests, um, when you use do you collect functions on top at the bottom in, diff in outside files? I ah, think often yeah. we start with we start with one file, yes, and it grows until it grows too long, mm -hmm. and then you move things out into other files. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think this is what we were saying many times that it's, it's difficult to have like the proper final design from day one. So start little, and as it grows, you can rearrange your files and uh, maybe split in different files. But usually you will start, you have no code, so you, one file is enough for one function. Yeah. yeah, sometimes I like to have this main function on top and then all the helper functions below, mm -hmm. if the language allows for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that if you open a file, you see the most important the main, thing first. Yeah. Yeah. In Python, it's the opposite. I have all the functions, and at the end, I have the main. Mm -hmm. I think everybody has that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if we can. We should be able to do the other way around. No? Or what I like yeah. usually is to move out uh, the function when there are too many. And my main is like one very tiny page. Right, yeah. Okay. Next question. Mm -hmm. So do we take the one from the notebook or? Yeah, let's talk about notebooks. Okay. Okay. So it's about Jupyter notebooks, but I think not only, it can be any notebook. It can be, I think the same question is for our, our Markdown, our yeah, studio, yeah. same question for Pluto and anything. So the question is where and how do you store the data that you use in these notebooks? So we read the data from somewhere then we do something with it and we plot it and analyze it and but where where do we store the data yeah. how do you store it what i'll always wherever i have space <laughs> yeah i mean to me this question is the same if it doesn't say notebooks like where do i store data do i store yes. it as part of repository do i store it somewhere does the code automatically download it or do i expect mm. the user to download it do I expect the user to give a path to where they've downloaded the data and so on and so on? I mean, a notebook isn't really anything special. It's code running on a computer in a certain working directory that might be in a certain environment somehow, somewhere or the other. Okay, but let's imagine that the notebook is on, let's say, you know, it's on GitHub mm -hmm. and it and it's coupled to Binder and it mm -hmm. has it has a, a well-defined environment, requirements text. And it reads data. Yeah. So where is that data? I mean, is it any different if it's in Binder or if you're running it on your own computer? Someone can clone this repository, set up the environment, and they need the data. 
So I think it's probably safe to say, if you're asking this question, the data is too big to fit in the Git repository itself. But so yes. if, it, if it's not too big, then maybe that's the natural place, right? You put it in the same yes. place as the notebook. Yeah. And then if it is too big, then the code should somehow refer to it. How is too big? How big is too big? Mm. A few mega is already too big for GitHub. <laughs> so more than 10 megabytes? Yes, I see. Yeah. 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 I think until 10, I will still put it there. Yeah. I think I even put a bit more sometimes. Yeah. So then it's somewhere else, in some archive or in some storage, and yeah. then, the, then the notebook fetches it from storage. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the best uh, if you, this is really big data, you should probably use like some kind of object storage where you don't need to download the data. Mm -hmm. Because on Binder, it will be a killer. It will not yeah. be, allow you to do that. And that's a great point. So sometimes you don't actually download the data at all, but you rather send the notebook to the data. Mm -hmm. So the data is somewhere on some service. And the service hopefully has a way of running a Docker image, singularity image, maybe with a notebook in it. So you send the analysis scripts to the data. That can be a, can be an option. Yeah, yes, that uh, can be. A, it's probably the most efficient for large data. Yeah. Yeah. So there is no single answer, a simple answer. Yeah. Depend on the size of the data. I, I guess on the community. Yeah. And the practice in the community. But for small data, as close as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for know... medium size, I put Zenodo, honestly. Yeah, uh, Zenodo, and, yeah. yeah. And even from my binder, you can access data from Zenodo. And I think that's fine until how much? 50 gigabyte? How much? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Zenodo, you can even ask if this is larger, but yeah. it's up yeah. to 50 gigabyte. It's already quite uh, nice yeah. for a notebook. Mm -hmm. I think what we should not do is to read data from slash home slash my username slash, yes. um, yeah. because that will only work on my own on hard drive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that would be uh, true for any any code you share. Yeah, exactly. No, don't put relative pass or um, absolute pass would be even worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hard, don't hard code files, name file names. I mean, unless possible. this unless the configuration is part of the thing and someone is expected to mm. download and configure this to run on your own data somehow. Uh, anyway. Mm. So we have like 10-ish minutes left. Yeah. yeah. We could, a little bit related, before we go back to Git, we could talk about the wor workflow and the script. Mm. Good yeah, idea. I think we had many questions like that. Next yeah. next time we sh should uh, maybe put more emphasis on mm -hmm. on showing so why why a workflow and not a simple script. And one um, can turn the question around. I mean, why or uh, when when is workflow better and when is a script yeah. better? And what is a workflow even? I mean, a script is a workflow in that sense. It's a very simple one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's what do you call a workflow? Thing. Is something you need to uh, to use a workflow management system? Yeah, I think in a workflow, in in a script, we we describe steps, and in a workflow, we dis we mainly describe dependencies, also steps. I mean, we also need to tell it mm. what to actually do, but we we focus more on dependencies. In a script, we focus more on the order of things. Mm. And yes, yeah, that's true. A script, I think, is really fine if if the whole job takes five seconds or two minutes, I don't know, because that's fine. I think the workflow can be really good if we have lots of tasks to run, many steps, and they maybe depend on each other, and we want to be able to either run them in in parallel, or we want to be able to run only part of it without going in and commenting out lines. Mm -hmm. Then it's a workflow. 
Yes. Yeah. I think once you start to write a workflow, it's hard to go back to script. Mm -hmm. Because scripts are, they can, I mean, it's very messy very quickly. So I would say if you have a very few tasks to do, to write, a script is really great. Mm -hmm. If you cannot fit in a one page, maybe you should start to think about a workflow management system. Yeah. Because it means it probably takes a bit of time to run. But maybe not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it takes hours, I would already go for workflow. Yeah. Um, if there are things that could be run in parallel, because the workflow will parallelize for us if if there are imminent tasks. So if I want to process 200 data files and produce 200 images, and it takes longer than a couple of seconds, I will already benefit from a workflow, probably. Mm -hmm. Can I ask about workflow managers? So SnakeMake is nice it looks nice but to me it's a bit too heavyweight so i've never used it oh yeah it really it's one of the simplest one <laughs> <laughs> like whenever i tried using it for a previous research software hour thing it was just too much and it got annoyed and like i know i can hardly see myself using it for many things is there anything sort of more lightweight you could recommend or oh, lightweight i don't know yeah. more light so many people like next flow mm -hmm. and more than snake make um mm -hmm. i think this is because the syntax maybe is uh yeah. i don't know maybe closer to python or whatever mm -hmm. so i've seen things that look more lightweight but i haven't tried it myself so i don't have experience yeah. so which one for instance one that kind of looked nice to me was this do it. Yeah. I've oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. We should before. try to look at. Yes, that's, that's right. Like. Yeah, I know someone that once used do it all along. Well, this was five or more years ago. And I mean, it seemed like about the right level of lightweightness. I'd like something that would be sort of as simple or obvious as a make file, but then include Python in there, which I guess is sort of what snake make tries to be, but yeah. Yeah. Make file without the tabs and without, with better, like actually understandable syntax, mm -hmm. or, or understandable wildcards. Yeah. Do it is uh, you can automate any anything or is it only used for automating Python? I haven't tried it. Yeah. Because the syntax is really nice. When I was making this video editing script, I realized, oh, this could be a workflow manager and then get all the dependencies and do stuff. But, well. We use, we used to uh, do talk about common workflow language rather than no, in code refinery, mm -hmm. which is not simple, but at least it's, it is interoperable. So mm -hmm. maybe uh, if you, whatever you choose, you should try to uh, choose something which can be converted to CWL. Yeah. And snake make, I think it can. Yeah, and there is this joke, and I probably have said it a million times, that there is this joke that every student and postdoc accidentally invents their own workflow management system <laughs> yes. during their studies. Yeah. OK. Should we try to do the two more yeah. questions? Yeah. Which one first, the detached head or the other one? Detached head is hopefully fast. Hmm. Okay, that's it. So the question is, can you explain what is the detached head in Git? And when do you have it? Yeah. You know, this is a funny story. So this was um, back um, 
This was maybe 2014 or so. I gave some Git tutorials to my group and then a few weeks or months later, someone came and said, yeah, I've been trying to use it, but I see messages like I have a detached head. What's going on here? And that was pretty funny. But anyway, I think it sort of shows some of the Git user interface issues, which we can have. So maybe we have to say what a branch is. So you can check out a branch. And then when you make a new commit, then the branch points to the new commit. So basically, the branch is a pointer that moves as you make new commits. Yeah, I like to think of branches as like a sticky note. Mm. It's a sticky note yes. that sticks to a commit. Mm -hmm. And as we create new commits, we move the sticky note forward. So a, a detached head is a yeah. no sticky note? Yeah, so if you do git checkout with a raw commit hash instead of the branch, then git will make the files, will check out the files at that state. But since it's the commit hash you're at, then when you make a new commit, what does it point to? Well, it points to the new commit. So if you check out something else, then nothing will point to that anymore. So basically there's no more sticky note that's pointing to, this is a place that I made a commit and the commit is lost. But you don't always, I mean, you don't always get it when you have a commit. So it's not always worrying to have a detached head. Because in your case, you, it's not recommended to do that. So it's only a problem, yeah. actually, if you create commits that you want to find exactly. later. Yeah. Okay, if exactly. you don't create commits mm -hmm. or you don't care about finding them later, it's not a problem at all. Yeah. So yes. it's not always a, a problem to have a detached no. head. I mean, actually, yeah. I have many detached head when I check <laughs> backwards codes. Yeah. Yeah, in the kit, it's not a problem. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have super time management. And yes. The last uploaded question, but then we can go maybe freestyle. We can maybe take like one that we really want to talk about. But the last uploaded question was, is there a best practice for testing out where the changes on multiple branches actually work together? So we have emphasized the importance of developing different things or different branches, one branch from one thing only. But sometimes we want to test whether the, the thing on this branch works well with the other branch. Yeah. I what do we recommend? I think for that, the answer in the previous HackMD is pretty good. Make a new branch, merge them all together and test. Or if I was sure that I wouldn't lose track of what I did, I can merge them all into one branch, test it, and then reset backwards and undo the merge. But oh, if you if you have a problem, you mean? Yeah. But yeah, so you can create a new branch for testing. Into it, merge the one, also the other one. Then you can test them together, and then you can delete that branch. You still have the other two, and they are still not mixed. So it, it's often not a good idea to, if I want to test two branches, it's often, sometimes yes, but often not a good idea to merge the one into the other. Mm -hmm. But I could still I mean, do it, yeah. and I could still undo it if I. Yes. Yeah. It depends if you test locally or if you test, uh, you know, if you start to, to push on GitHub, it's yeah. not really recommended. Yeah, it's a bit like mixing, I don't know, water with wine. I mean, once it's mixed or something else, I mean, then it's difficult to unmix. Mm -hmm. So create a new branch from one of the branch and merge all the branches in that one. Yeah, like a temporary, oh, like an integration branch. Yeah, because what, maybe what, yeah, what we should say is a, a branch doesn't cost much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you can make as many as you want, because we can also delete them. Yeah. Any questions that you would like to 
that we do as a final one. Yeah, please give us a few more, more another vote if you'd like us to do anything. But I think we've had a good run today. Okay. Yeah, this was really not too difficult. So, yeah. Should we call it a night and get our rest now? Yes. Sounds great. Sounds great. Well then. We need to rest. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much for watching and listening and upvoting and the questions. And you can find these questions and and many more and answers on. Uh, so there is a link on top of the ICMD. Yeah. Okay. Well, see you all, who knows, maybe in two weeks, maybe not. I guess we'll see. What What is in two weeks? Well, oh, so next maybe, hour. Maybe another hour. research job. Oh. <laughs> so let's make it, uh, let, let's prepare it a bit more, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do we have a topic for next time? Yeah, so the dear listeners, the watchers, please suggest topics that you would like us to talk about. And announce it for us, so that way we have no choice but to do it. Yes, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, see you all next time. See you, looking forward, thanks. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.